Hello, everyone. Welcome to Transformation Through Unification. My name is Erin Carranza, and I am the founder of Transformation Through Unification. And this is my co-founder, Brian Hamilton. And we have some interesting news for you today. And since Brian was the one that put it together, and he was very excited about it, I'll let him tell you. Okay. So we've been, you know, we're we're still trying to get our organization going and we're trying to um, make it easier for people to contact us and to get uh, communicate uh, what they need from us. So um, what we've done is on our website, let me see, is there a way I can share my screen so I can show what we're doing here? Oh, wait a minute, here we go. I think, share my screen. Let's go ahead. So. So this is our um, website, if we can get that up on the screen, Aaron. Okay. Let's see. Bring it up now. There we go. There we go. Okay, there we go. So this is what our website looks like at the moment. And um, what we've done, what I've done is I've gone ahead, we've gone ahead and put a, uh, a buttons on each of our pipe pages that make, make it so that you can schedule an appointment if you need to. Um, and so if you come to this, it'll just basically bring up, uh, oh, hang on a second, I'm gonna try, uh, there we go. Um, it'll bring up this little form and all you have to do is just put in your information. So um, in this form here, and what will happen is after we've, we've received it, you will receive an email basically just asking you for some additional information. Uh, so things like um, it'll send you an informed consent form. This is basically so that way we can offer uh, therapeutic services. Um, it's, a, it's, pretty standard form. It basically just says, you know, like these are the things to expect and, you know, in, in therapy, these are some, you know, of our limitations in terms of uh, uh, confidentiality, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it'll also ask uh, you to submit a copy of the jurisdiction report and case plan so that that way we can kind of review that, get a sense of what's going on, and then we can uh, start scheduling um, appointments with you but this is just so that way it kind of makes it so it makes it a little bit so that we can we can more efficiently get back to you give you the information um, that you're looking for um, it also provides um, some information about um, you know um, you know essentially like so if i come in here and i answer no it asks it gives me gives you a chance also to put some information in there about uh about your case so that way we we can take a look at that and, and decide right. like what services that you need. Um, right. So. Because a lot of times you're in the middle of services. And mm -hmm. so that's why we give you the option to say, Hey, I'm in the middle. Um, just whether you've completed it or yeah. not. Um, yeah. And, and so like, yeah, yeah. This question here is basically just asking like where you are in your case plan. Like, are you awaiting your jurisdiction hearing, which is basically where, you know, where they decide, you know, who your kids are going to be with, what, you know, like how long, you know, what, what issue, what they want you to complete in terms of services before they'll reunite you. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working on your case plan, this is usually where I've seen most, you know, most parents, but, um, but this is basically like, okay, yeah, this is when they've said, like, we want you to do care parenting classes, co-parenting classes, addiction recovery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> this is basically kind of the end of it where they're starting to where they're planning to determine your parental rights um if they've already if you're just awaiting reunification we can still provide services because a lot of times after you've been reunited with your kids both of you are, are going through a lot of like separation trauma and mm -hmm. so this is a way to be able to provide you some additional support to 
uh, assist in that reunification because a lot of times kids will be really dysregulated when they come back. They're throwing things, they're getting really angry, they're throwing tantrums. And a lot of times there's that feeling that like, what, do they not love me anymore? Have I broken my kids? And the reality is most most likely no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably what's happened is, is the separation has been the problem. And and so this is a way of just giving you some therapy to, uh, to, to help with that reunification. Termination right. of parental rights, <clears throat> um, there's not, unfortunately, a lot of the kind of times, there's not a lot we can do in that situation to help you reunite. But what we can do is we can provide you some support as you're going through that grief process, because that is, that's a rough experience to go through and helping you to just kind of be able to, 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 um, you know, go through that grief and figure out what are we doing from here. So I, I um, went through the entire process with a client all the way up to termination. To, um, and they gave the family a 30 minute goodbye visit. It's Gosh. the most barbaric thing I have ever seen. Yeah. 30 minutes to say goodbye to your child forever. And, you know, whether you have reunited or they dismiss your case or anything like that, they don't give you any help afterwards. They come in and destroy your entire life. Give, say you, they give you your kid back, but they give you this child who has been so damaged by the removal and the loss of their sense of security that it's just like, oh, we're done with you. We've gotten what we wanted, so bye. And then you are left to pick up the pieces of the life that they have absolutely blown apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't even imagine as, a, you know, like as a parent, I would just, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I don't know how that would go. Like, I think it would just be devastating. To, uh, yeah. And the fact that there, here's 30 minutes to say goodbye to your baby who you have been fighting tooth and nail for is mm -hmm. barbaric. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is, I can't even describe the level of pain that I went through just watching it, not even mm -hmm. having to be the parent that went through it. I was sick to my stomach and I threw up and I cried for about four hours when I got home, but 30 minutes. So we can't, like Brian said, we can't do anything to help you once you've come up to your TPR hearing and you've lost your parental rights. We can point you in the direction of a good civil rights attorney, but how we can help you is with that grief mm -hmm. yeah. because nobody will help you with that grief. Right. CPS, they wash their hands of you. That's it. They don't care. They go on to the next lives to destroy. Right. And so that's, yeah. So, but, but I want to say too, just kind of in terms of the services that we're going to be able to provide already right now, we can provide parenting classes, co-parenting classes. We are working on getting um, addiction recovery classes approved. Um, and um, I'll be working on developing out a uh, uh, program for anger management, um, domestic violence survivors, because those are those are some of the things that are very frequently included in your case plan when you're um, working with CPS. And so those are going to be our, our big next steps as far as being able to provide those services. One thing I want to mention too is, is that the informed consent form that you're going to get is from Life Source Affordable Counseling. That's the company that I'm currently working for. Um, and, um, so just, if you see that, that's not a, that's not a mistake. That's, <laughs> that's actually the form that we need to fill out. And, um, and that's just so that we can do the services through, through, through that, uh, they're kind of like our, our partner organization for providing the, the services. Um, and eventually we will be offering those services directly, you know, through transformation, through reunification. Um, but as we're just kind of getting everything uh, going, this is this is the the process that we're planning to offer those therapeutic services. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's really uh, exciting for me because so when you call us, you get to speak to one of us. You don't mm -hmm. get. Um, you don't get an assistant. You don't get, you know, somebody just picking up the phone. You actually speak to us. We care. We talk to you. And mm -hmm. I'm really excited about the new formats and the filling out of the forms because that helps me help more people. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time going through emails and, and phone calls and messages. And a lot of times, unfortunately, I can't help you. 
because you have had your terminal rights Term, mm-hmm. your parental rights terminated. Ryan can help you, but mm-hmm. as of getting your children back, I can't help you. And I can point you to somebody who can, but I'm grateful that Brian is here to offer um, the grief services because even though I didn't lose my daughter, I got I regained my custody. That heartbreak still hasn't gone away. I'm still working in therapy to deal with that. It, it never goes away. So even if you've had your parental rights terminated, we can still offer you some some sort of services, some kind of help, some kind of healing. Yeah. And I think, you know, but I think the reality is, is the, the, the earlier you are in your process, mm-hmm. the, 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 the more we can help you. Um, the minute you get it, it's yes. so much more beneficial yeah. for you. Yeah. And even if you're a parent who is, you know, cause here's another one of the things that I find is, 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 is a struggle is that if you're a parent who is a DV survivor Mm -hmm. and you are, and you've left that relationship and you've, you know, and, um, you know, and you've established your own home, this can still happen because there can be a situation where like, if there is still abuse that's, you know, that's occurring, that can be a situation where, um, CPS might get involved and go, why didn't you make a report? Why haven't you done anything there? And then they take your kids away, even though you have left the relationship. Right. And Failure so one to of the, protect. Yeah. So one of the things that we want to do is, is that if that, if that's your, if that describes your situation, like still please reach out because we can start to help you figure out like what you have to do to lay the, like the legal foundation to make mm-hmm. sure that you can keep your kids, that they're going to be, you know, that they're, that, um, that, the law is essentially going to be on your side in trying to make sure that you're, um, you know, maintaining that custody because a lot of times that, you know, like if you, if you can get that groundwork, so, you know, solidified, you don't even have to go through this process. Mm-hmm. You've gotten it to a place where, you know, okay, I have an attorney. I have, you know, I've, I've filed the report with the police. I've filed the report with CPS. I've done all my due diligence. I can demonstrate that I have, um, like a therapist and that I have somebody who's helping me with kind of just identifying what I need to um, talk with my attorneys about. Those are, right. those are the cases where we can really be successful and keep you from even going through this mm-hmm. process. <laughs> yeah. Because they like to um, come after the low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. So um, if they see that you have a support system, that you know your rights, that you're doing everything that you need to do before they get involved, they're less likely to continue the harassment. They're less mm-hmm. likely to come in and think, all right, I'm going to take this, this kid. I mean, it can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. I've seen them taken from therapists, lawyers, dentists, doctors, teachers, um, social workers. I've seen social workers lose their children to other social workers. It really mm-hmm. doesn't matter who you are. It matters yeah. how you prepare for what's coming next. Right. And, and so if you are in the middle of your case and you're kind of like wondering what's happening. We can help you get really solid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can... One of the things, yeah. One of the things that I find with my, with my clients is they don't even, they're, they're, um, they've never heard of a CFT meeting. Mm-hmm. And this is such an important piece of the, of the, of the puzzle because it's supposed to happen within, I think it's 90 days of your, um, of once you've, you know, once they've, uh, place your children in, in foster care or with a, with a family member. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times they don't even, they, they don't, they don't, it happens like six months later right. if it happens at all. And a right. lot of, you know, and so a lot of times it's really important. You know, one of the things that I'm talking with my clients about is have you had that meeting yet? Uh, because that's, if you have that meeting, that's demonstrating to them that you care and um, and even though they aren't offering it <laughs> like right up front, um, being able to say like, Hey, I would like to have a meeting so that we can discuss like where we are. And, I, um, and Aaron and I can provide you with kind of like an overview of like, this is, these are the questions they're going to ask you about. These are the things that, um, that you should expect to, to, to be, you know, to, to advocate for when you go into that meeting. Right. Yeah, I know it's scary to be able to, to interact with CPS, but that's the one, that's the, those are the ways that we get 
we teach you, you know, how to interact yeah. with them and on a positive way so they can't turn around what you say. Um, and we teach you how to speak to them, how to present in court, how to ask questions. So it wasn't, so it won't be used against you because they will use everything against you. Mm -hmm. And if you're just now starting in your case, you should know that from your court hearing, the caseworker must give you your referrals for your services within seven days. Mm -hmm. The time frame to do all of your services is so fast mm -hmm. that <laughs> they must give it to you within seven days. If they don't, you will not make it in time for your six month hearing. Mm -hmm. And Kind of that on purpose. So if you're just now starting, make sure you are up their asses mm -hmm. about getting your referrals. They have seven days to do it. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I gotta yeah. get my charger, yes. my phone, my computer's gonna die. Hold on, I'll be Not right back. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So and kind of just mirroring what Aaron was saying is that like um a lot of times they are going to tell you those things. And so it's important for, you know, to, to, to advocate for yourself and to say like, Hey, um, I haven't received this information. If you could please, you know, get back to me as soon as you can. And then, you know, and if they aren't getting back to you, being able to, to, to advocate with the next person, you know, is to say like, you know, is to go to their manager and state, you know, I haven't received this information yet. I'm not sure where I'm supposed to, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. Those kinds of things. Once you, you know, I've seen I've seen families where um, they weren't getting that information, and then once they started advocating for themselves, and it's you know, and, and <laughs> it's important to make sure that you know that you're assertive and stating you know very clearly like this is what I need, you know, without getting combative about it by basically saying you know like I I haven't heard back from you. If I don't hear back from you by X date. Then I'm going to have to, you know, to 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 contact your supervisor to, um, uh, to 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 escalate this. And I have seen families where, like, they were just kind of trying to be, you know, like not ruffle any feathers, not really doing anything, and uh, you know, to 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 potentially bring the wrath of whatever from high atop the thing down upon their heads, and. Um, you know, and I, and and just, but once they start advocating for themselves in that in that very assertive, polite manner, things started moving. And I've seen I've seen families like within weeks start to get, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, like discussions of reunification going and getting, um, you know, unsupervised visitations. And that's what we want to do. And that's that's the that's that's why it's so important to be able to communicate with them and i know for so many families it's terrifying because they'll go in and they'll be like you know they'll they'll ask you something really simple and you're like oh yeah no no big deal yeah i'll do this and then all of a sudden now you've got this piece of information that they're using against you to you know justify taking your kids away mm -hmm. and um you know but the biggest thing is is just being able you know figuring out how to communicate with them in an effective way so that that doesn't happen or if it has happened figuring out a way to communicate with them effectively so that you know you are advocating for that for your, you know for you and your family and demonstrating that like i am a good parent and it is amazing how once you start kind of you know like complying and cooperating and advocating for yourself how quickly those you know you know you can get your kids back and 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 start making making real headway in your case. So yeah, I um when I started out, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to I'm going to burn this house down. They took away my child without a warrant based on lies and you know, my husband was only trying to control custody. He didn't want to pay alimony. So I was ready to just burn it down. I told my caseworker I didn't give a fuck what he thought of her said, and I was just all piss and vinegar. And then I realized that that wasn't getting me anywhere. Right. You have to play the game, and we'll teach you how to play the game. Now, I left, I left dependency court with my custody intact, 50-50, and then we got kicked into family court. So I can tell you from personal experience, I know what needs to be done. To get dependency court, um, I have testified in seven different states, and also globally. 
I'm an expert in CFT meetings. I'm a court appointed advocate. Um, and I learned how to play their game by watching and really have to be polite, but also stand your ground. Mm -hmm. You have to um, not be a, uh, a pushover or too quiet, but you can't be a raging bitch <laughs> because they will use that against you. But you have to be, you have to be polite and demanding at the same time. These are your children. Mm -hmm. And you need to show the court that you will do whatever is necessary to get your children back. When the court right. says you need to jump, you say how high. Right. You and know, I think it's just, it is yeah. what it is. Yeah. And that's one of the things, you know, like a lot of times I get clients and they've never touched a substance mm -hmm. in their entire, you know, like, like maybe they drink wine occasionally, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. at like family events and they have like maybe like a, you know, a drink or two or something like that. But that's it. Like they've never done marijuana. They've never done cocaine. They've never done methamphetamines or anything like that. And yet they're still expected to do drug testing and to go into mm -hmm. drug rehab. And, and it's frustrating, you know, and a lot of times they're like, why should I have to do this when I've never done anything, you know, that should be problematic. Right. And the reality is because they're just, because they told you to. <laughs> you have to. You have and, to. and yeah. I, like I told Brian, if, you are ordered to drug test and you're not doing it out of some form of protest. Mm -hmm. I won't take you on. I won't help you. The reason being is if you're in the middle of services, like you have four more parenting classes to do, you have some therapy to do. We can work with that. We can explain that to the court. Mm -hmm. If you have drug testing and you're not doing it, the court doesn't care everything else that you've done. They don't care about your attorney. They don't care about me. They don't care about Brian. They don't care about all the other services that you finished. Mm -hmm. They will take that and you will never see your children again. Right. And that includes if you have car problems or anything like that. Like I've seen parents, you know, like they, they just, because again, a lot of times what happens in a situation like this is that so many families, they just, they lose their jobs. They, be, mm -hmm. you know, and they're spending so much. It's designed to destroy you every yeah. part of your life. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and as a result, they're spending and they're spending so, all of their time kind of working on the case because they have to go in like once or twice a, a week, you know, to, to mm -hmm. complete these services. And so they start suffering financially. And as a result, you know, usually what tends to happen, I don't know what it is about, like the, the laws of the universe. But whenever you're really in like financial trouble, that's when the check engine light comes on. Right. right. And so they don't have transportation to get to their their their. Uh, drug testing and but that's another thing that often you know it goes overlooked is that cps can provide you know um you know basically public transportation uh call mm -hmm. you know can, can they, they can you, cover they, yeah they give you um bus passes mm -hmm. they give you gas cards mm -hmm. look they have your children mm -hmm. there is nothing that i would not do to get my baby back you want me to drug test every 25 minutes? Fucking fine. Mm -hmm. You want me to do this? Fine. Mm -hmm. Do what the court asks you to do. And then once you get your children, then you come back around and mm -hmm. then you punish them for all the mm -hmm. wrongs that they did. But for now, mm -hmm. you do what they say. Right. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is until the system is mm -hmm. overhauled. Yeah. But if you want yeah. your children back, you're doing this. And this might sound harsh. But if you are not doing your drug testing, I don't think that you want your child back. Mm -hmm. Because your children are with strangers, floundering, not knowing where you are, not knowing why they're in this situation, and you can't get up and drug test. That I'm sorry. I, I had to drug test the whole time I was there, randomly. I had to be there in 30 minutes or I was considered... Um, that I failed a drug test. So I did it. I've never, I didn't, there was no reason for me to be doing it. You know, my mm. ex just said I was on drugs, so they ordered mm. it. So I mm. did it anyways. It destroyed any type of me of getting a job because I had to go and do all my services, do all my classes, but I still did it because I didn't mm. want my daughter not to have a mother just because I couldn't do it. I, I didn't mm. want to do it. Well, I'm not on drugs, so why should I do it? Why shouldn't you do it? Right. Don't make this a time for protest. Yeah. 
They have and I wanna, children. Yeah. And I want to say too, that just as a therapist, you know, like um, I, you know, I do work with families who, where the, you know, where the caregiver is struggling to do the drug testing for right. Oh, I should, of reasons. We should make yeah. a distinction. Yes. I will not do reunification courses with you unless right. you are doing your case plan and your drug classes, because right. I might be a wizard and a witch, but I'm not that powerful. <laughs> I can't make yeah. that go away. Yeah. And the judges, when they see that there's no drug testing, yeah, that's it for reunification. Right. Now, Brian can continue to help you, but I just, yeah. I can't yeah. because I focus on reunification. Yeah. Right. And what we would be working on together is that, you know, in our sessions is what's making it challenging. Because mm -hmm. sometimes it is, it's something where it's like a, it's, it's hard to get there, you know, mm -hmm. for, because your car is broken down or you're living out in the middle of, you know, like um, the desert and mm -hmm. there really isn't public transportation. And so but how once are, we get more donations yeah. in fact, and, yes. and for, we will be able to provide that for you. Yes. That's one of our, so, yeah, that's one of our mm -hmm. goals in the future. And, and honestly, if that's something that you as listeners think that you can provide other people, like, please reach out to us. Cause we mm -hmm. also can, you know, we would, you know, we would love to start having volunteers who can, who can, who can provide, you know, transportation to other people. Um, who are struggling financially or, um, you know, or there's a safety issue involved, you know, like we'd be, we would be happy to have you uh, work with us and, 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 um, and help we out. We need advocates yes. for you as, yes. as well. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, if you feel like you can be an advocate to somebody who's really struggling right now, because that's the other thing, a lot of times family will just kind of run from you because they're like, well, you brought this on yourself. And the reality you is, is no. You must have done something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, and a, no. Yeah. <laughs> and the reality is, is so often it's something beyond the person's control. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, um, if you think that you could be an advocate or a support for somebody, you know, during this period of time, you know, and you'd like to, to help us, like, please contact us and just, you know, we can, you know, and we can um, talk with our clients and basically connect them with you so that you can be a support for them, particularly if you've gone through this process yourself and, you know, and, and you just want to be able to say like, yeah, I've done this. This is what I had to go through. Like, I really feel for you. I, I know this is a struggle. We'd be, we would love to have you be able to provide some support to our um, to our uh, clients. I mean, why do you think that I'm doing what I'm doing? Everything that I'm doing and that we're doing is because I had to go through it. Mm -hmm. So everything that they did to me, I am trying to make it easier for another parent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to undo their nonsense. Like if you mm -hmm. can't get to your visits, let us know. Yeah. If you can't get to drug testing, let mm -hmm. us know. Yeah. You know, if you need, or you're grieving, let us know. There mm -hmm. is, they give you therapy there. And I say that loosely. <laughs> if you could call mm -hmm. it therapy, because their therapists are not even qualified to be therapists, mm -hmm. but they also go as far as violating your HIPAA rights by mm -hmm. telling your caseworker everything that happened in your therapy part, in session. Mm -hmm. And they're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. a huge violation. All yeah. they're allowed to say is, yes, you're attending. Yes, you're showing up. You're being productive. There mm -hmm. is no going into details about how you feel about your ex or how your heart is feeling about being in separation with your mm -hmm. child. That's a huge mm -hmm. violation, and it yeah. should be reported. Mm -hmm. and, freak, and honestly, they aren't really even supposed to communicate at all with your social worker right. without an authorization right. to release on file. And one of the things that I want to say, too, is that as a therapist, when I'm working with my clients i i will have you fill out like a form that basically gives me kind of like carte blanche to be able to say whatever but um but i will discuss with you ahead of time like this is what i'm planning on just telling them mm -hmm. if they ask is there anything that you would want me to withhold um so that that way um oh well i'm speaking yeah. about the specific forms that these social yeah. workers fill out and submit to your caseworker yeah, they do Which say, yeah, they do obscene. usually get an authorization to release on file. Yeah. But no, no, no. The stuff that they release, like mm. obscene. This, mm -hmm. What are you talking about my great grandparents for? Like, what does that have to do with anything? What are you talking about my first husband for? What does that have to do with what I'm doing right now? Right. So, you know, yeah. I've had clients that haven't finished their therapy sessions because they don't trust their therapist. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. guess what? We have a therapist here that yeah. will not do that to you. And mm -hmm. we'll follow the law and not violate your HIPAA. 
-hmm. Everything that we do here is designed to get you back with your children. Right. And, and I, I think, say that yeah. with my whole heart. Now, I'm not CPS saying, oh, our first goal is to reunify. No, it isn't. Fuck that. Fuck them. That's mm -hmm. my first goal. Mm -hmm. Having yeah. gone through it. Yeah. And yeah, usually if I'm re revealing information about our sessions in relation to anything, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be things that like we have discussed together. And I'm going to say sure. like, this is what I'm planning on discussing with them. Do you have any problems with that? And as long right. as you're comfortable with it, then I will go forward. But I have had clients say, yeah, I don't really want you to talk about the fact that we've been discussing my, you know, as Aaron was saying, my grandmother for the last three sessions, because yeah. they're not going to understand what that's about, even though we There's recognize. There's a history of drinking because grandma and grandpa had a few ones on their wedding day in World War II. Literally, that's what happens. Yeah. And, what does but, that have to do with my case now? <laughs> Nothing. They're just trying to show that you are a piece of shit person. Right. And but it I runs think, in your family. Yeah. And what we do is we work on, you know, if I'm going to reveal that information and the social worker has that information, it's more about the fact that we're, we're working through that trauma and figuring out how to make it so that it's no longer affecting, you know, like decisions that happen. And it does, it does affect it, you know, because it is a situation where, you know, like, you know, the grand, you know, you're, great grandfather and you know was in world war ii and then you know came home with ptsd and had an addiction mm -hmm. problem and that passed on to your you know your your grandparents and so on and so forth like it does happen like that but um you know and so we can work through those things but it's just being aware that that's um that I'm not going to reveal that information if you feel that's going to be detrimental. You know, I'll be talking about the fact that we've been working on past trauma. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah. Um, so I I will take this minute, since we're talking about therapy, to talk about my therapist, mm -hmm. who um, I'm suing because mm -hmm. she violated a bunch of stuff. So we had really great sessions. Um, it ended up me teaching her how to put eyeliner and fake lashes on in my last session. <laughs> and then um, when it came down to it, we got the report back from her and it said something completely different. It said, you know, Aaron is obsessed with her, her husband. No, I wasn't. I was already with somebody else by then. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, happy birthday, Dave. I love you. Um, and so then it said that um, I refused to co-parent with him and I refused to do all of this. And then they needed like five more sessions. Mm. Well, I realized what I realized was once you sign your piece of paper with them, if you look all the way down in the fine print, there's a spot that says if CPS removes themselves from your case or dismisses your case, you are still on the hook to pay for that therapy, those five sessions. And they will come after you for those five sessions. So I was talking to a friend of mine, Mr. Davis, and he goes, that looks a little bit like conspiracy to commit fraud with a social worker. If I, you know, mm. I don't know, you know, look into it maybe. And I did look into it and I reported her to the board of behavioral sciences, but her testimony and her reports that were violated of my HIPAA, that's the reason that they were, that the county was really fighting hard for me not to get my daughter back. Oh, well, look at the therapist says she has um, issues with her husband. She's still in love with him. She's still obsessed with him. She doesn't want to co-parent with him. And I'm like, what? The mm -hmm. So it really affects your case. Mm -hmm. And if they have a personal bias against you, they don't like you, they will put something in there and you're screwed. Luckily, I had a fantastic public defender Guzman, thank you, I love you, who fought really hard against it and even went to the um, therapist's boss at the facility that she practiced and got on her about it because my therapist, my lawyer talked to her, said all these wonderful things. And then when the report comes out, it's something completely different. It happens to everybody. So my attorney got on their butts, the whole facility to get them to reverse what they were saying because it wasn't true. She just wanted more sessions with me. She wanted me to pay the 150 for five, four or five more sessions. Hmm. And it almost cost me my custody. Yeah. And, you know, and I want to say do that to you. 
Yeah, I want to say, yeah, I mean, there are times when it's it's challenging to say something and I do, you know, and I will talk with, you know, with my clients about that and say, like, this is an area where I really, you know, I know this would be helpful for your case, but I can't, you know, comment on that because of X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. um, or it may be a situation where, like, we're seeing something, you know, I'm seeing something in our sessions and I do have to report on, you know, I may you know, I'll put it in a progress letter, but I'll explain to you, like, this is what I'm planning on putting in and how I'm, you know, planning on wording it. And I do, you know, I do work with your, you know, you know, with your attorneys and just make sure that, you know, because again, not going to lie, but all, you know, and, it, you know, in my progress letters, but I will say, you know, I do recognize there are sometimes those, those, uh, uh, like statements that you put a particular way and they say, you know, and they'll be like, well, this could be potentially read this way as far as like a legal person, you know, per, mm -hmm. you know, for legal purposes. And I can be like, okay, you know, I'll reword that a little bit so that it's, you know, it's not going to hit that landmine potentially. Right. Um, yeah. But, um, but that's, yeah. So I am very upfront about what I'm going to, you know, what I'm going to put in my, my, reports and if there's anything too where you know because as a mandated reporter there are times when i do have to report things like you know child abuse or something like that or you know or child neglect and if that happens like i'll let you know so that you're not wondering like how did they find this information out i'm gonna you know be very upfront about it even if it's something that's been reported before i do have to put it in there um uh um so just be, but that's just some of those things. And if there's anything that you don't feel comfortable discussing, you know, we can still work around it. Even, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging and I, and I, I, I feel it, <laughs> but you know, we can. We are not in cahoots things. with CPS. We are right. here to help you. So you right. don't have to be afraid of what you can and can't discuss in therapy. Mm -hmm. We want you to get your children back. We right. want you to get better. We want you to be stronger. We want you to have better mental health. Right. So we will do everything to make that possible as long as you put the effort in as well. But we, we are, you, you're not just a number to us. We care right. about your mental well being and your emotional well being and your physical well being. Right. Yes. And generally, from what I have seen, it's usually a situation where it's somebody has really got, there's been a misunderstanding. There's been, you know, a, um, you know, the person was the, the, the DV victim. And um, what are those statistics again about the DV victims in dependency court yeah, and CPS? Yeah. It's on our website. It's 51%, 51% of uh, uh, caregivers whose children are in foster care are uh, survivors of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's, again, it's that it's the, the failure to protect that usually, that usually gets them and, and it's unfortunate. And there are movements to try and change some of the way those laws are written and to, to, um, you know, to, to make sure that those individuals aren't getting, um, essentially screwed over for mm -hmm. something that didn't even, they didn't even do wrong. Um, right. Like but, you said, they've moved out. They've got mm -hmm. restraining orders, they have a new place, mm -hmm. and they still lose their children. Yeah, I've even seen situations where, yeah, they, yeah, exactly what, what Aaron's describing. They've, they've done everything right, moved out, got the restraining order, got, you know, called CPS, called, you know, the police, made the reports, did everything, mm -hmm. got everything in, 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 in line. And the state and the social worker is still saying, well, why didn't you do it sooner? And then they and give the <laughs> child to the abuser. Yes. And that, that happens too. But mm -hmm. it's again, you know, so we can't guarantee that, you know, that we can give, you know, that, they'll, that they won't take away your kids, but we will do everything in our power to make sure that you're, you are in a solid place. You're prepared for this fight. And that you're prepared for it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't, we do recognize that the kids being with you is the most important thing. And yeah. What, what was that? We'll have to find the, the actual numbers, but what was the study about leaving children in an abusive home and offering services is better than removing them because of it's, the trauma? Yeah. There, it's, it's not one particular pa uh, research paper, but there's been multiple ones, but basically like the literature review has basically shown that like, um, you know, it, it, it at, at worst, it's no better 
than mm-hmm. leaving them in the home, you know? Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, then, you know, so like kids who are in foster care versus kids who are left in, you know, left with the, in, in an abusive home, like generally like their mental health overall is about the same, mm-hmm. but it, in, there've been some studies that have demonstrated that it's, 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 it can, you know, that keeping them in the home actually um, is better for their mental health um than those and that they have like long term after you know after they turn 18 like they have you know better careers they have you know they have less run-ins with law enforcement they're less likely to have their kids taken by cps Mm -hmm. um and so you know so that's kind of what the the research shows but the really interesting piece is that um if we can you know in in situations where they're where it's not seriously detrimental to the children you know to the to the children to to leave them in the home is that um the parents are more likely to complete their case plans if they if they are able to keep their kids but even better than that is it costs less it's like for every dollar in prevention that we spend it saves the it saves the government three dollars in um in uh governmental costs to uh uh help these children and because of the fact that they aren't having to they aren't having that trauma that accompanies being removed from their homes so what's supposed to happen is that they're supposed to come in and do their little evaluation and then offer you services first and then remove the child Mm -hmm. services first and then removal they're not doing that they're coming in and they're snatching kids away making you go to court giving you 10 minutes to look at your freaking paperwork and then making you do services. Right. So it's like trauma, 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 trauma. And then here, 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 you know, now you do your service. Yeah. They're supposed to offer those first. If you have domestic violence or you need parenting classes, how better to apply them while you're in there, you keep your children, you learn as a family, you learn mm-hmm. and you grow and, and that's what they're supposed to do. That's, that's right. the original thing is services first, right? then removal. And I think a big part of the reason that it's not that way is that that law is fairly new. It's, I think, I mean, it's not brand new. I think it's like two decades old or something like that. It's a, what is it? It's the, I can't remember the name of the law now. Anyway, it'll come to me. Um, but basically there was a law that was passed that was designed with the intent of providing the services in, you know, in home first but you got to keep in mind that this process that we have in place is decades old Mm -hmm. and a lot of times it takes a while for those kinds of changes to to um to take place because they are just operating under like this is how we've always done things well i am i am friends with a another and he will not even consider removal unless parents are given the opportunity to do services first. He, mm-hmm. That's the last thing. He will not sign warrants, nothing. Mm-hmm. He's, they come to him and he's like, no, 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 mm-hmm. no, no. Because he understands right. how traumatizing it is. Right. So oh. in his little teeny town, I think it was like 185 kids in foster care. And he got it down in two years to, I think, 34 kids in foster care, which is oh, wow. huge. But that's because he was following these other uh, guidelines, services first. Keep mm-hmm. the kids in the home first. And if it's absolutely essential for you to remove them, if there's sexual violence, severe physical abuse, then come to me. But don't come to me if, you know, it's just some, you know, neighbor squabble or it's just, you know, the teenager doesn't want to be there. So she called CPS to get out of the house or get her parents in trouble. Um, he's really like a shining light in dependency court. And um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to get him back on the show. But um, mm-hmm. I was amazed by him because usually it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, take, take, take. And he's like, no, stop it. Right. Stop it right now. Yeah. But that's that's kind of what we're what what is going to need to happen is it takes a minute because that's how judges have been trained is to take the kids first. And it makes, you know, and like, it's one of those things where it's like common sense, you know, that's one of those things that like comes up so often. And to me, it's like, and as a therapist, I'm like, 
yeah, that co- that idea of common sense doesn't quite always isn't quite so sensical as it sounds at first glance. Mm-hmm. But it makes common sense to remove the children because you don't want them to get hurt. You don't want them to get abused. You don't want them to be neglected. It makes sense to remove them. But the reality is like the 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 deeper problem is removing them and placing them with a foster care family doesn't necessarily ensure their safety. If, you know, because they're four times more likely if you're a girl to, to, to be uh, sexually molested mm-hmm. um, if they're placed in an inpatient, you know, like an, uh, like, a, um, like a group home. Yep. If, you know, they're, they are 60% of the children who are recovered by the FBI um, from sex trafficking were in foster care at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, there are, you know, there are families who, you know, we've interviewed um, on our shows where there were locks on the refrigerator in their foster care family and they were you know and any money that they were getting that was supposed to be you know dedicated to providing them like food clothing shelter all of those kinds of things they were going to their you know to their uh, to their biological kids mm-hmm. and um and so you hear these horror stories from the kids who are actually in the system they're not necess- they're not necessarily going to loving homes sometimes they are <laughs> but um but that's that's where we that's the problem and that's the thing that's not common sense is that taking them from the home isn't and putting them in foster care is not necessarily removing them from um you know from harm if in in many cases it's out of the frying pan and into the fryer uh or into the fire sorry <laughs> hey that's the title um, of my book <laughs> and um and so that's one of the things that um it's going to take time for people to learn that. And a lot of times people within like the judicial system, you know, within, you know, within law enforcement, within CPS, they don't understand a lot of the history behind the, you know, the system. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand a lot of the psychology behind attachment. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand a lot of the, uh, how detrimental it can be to, remove you know and that you know to remove a child from somebody who um honestly in many cases as we were mentioning before has been a victim themselves or really didn't have you know like serious issues like they may be using marijuana recreationally or something to that effect and now they've lost their kids Mm -hmm. and um and so it's a situation where we want to make sure that unless you know like as a therapist, my philosophy is that as long as it has it, you know, is that unless it's like life-threatening danger to the children, clear and articulable danger. Yeah, yeah which is That's what it used is. to be. Yeah, which is what it used to be. That used to be the uh, the criteria. Mm-hmm. Um, they should remain in the home. And while that sounds kind of scary and dangerous, and you know, and in a lot of situations, and shouldn't we be doing more to protect kids? The numbers in terms of like child deaths as a result of you know of abuse or neglect have actually gone up since we have um, you know loosened up the criteria for their removal. And so it does it you know, and that's partly because <clears throat> while we've increase the number of people who can report we've actually decreased the number of people who can investigate and so this is part of the reason why we get into this situation where kids are being removed and um you know at an alarming rates it's because it's you know is they're you know and they aren't being placed in in safe homes is because the resources that are available to do that have gone down and it's just yeah <laughs> it's 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 i don't know if there's a word to describe the feeling heartbreaking doesn't do it soul crushing doesn't do it um like uh, many of you know i lost my daughter because i tried to take my own life and my husband called on me um i had already done emdr i had already done therapy with my children before cps came into my house so i was already in the process of correcting my mistake and it was used against me so when you have your child removed, it's, I have a client who gave birth. The hospital came in, removed the baby from the mama's breast while she was nursing and took her into another hospital. 
the mom was suffering with postpartum depression. Now the mom has postpartum psychosis. Psychosis. Well, I fucking would too. You come in and you take my brand new baby off of my breast. Don't even let her unlatch. And you take her away because the hospital said that daddy was hugging the baby too much. Mm -hmm. I absolutely would go crazy. Yeah. And we need to retrain mandated reporters. I've talked to a lot of um, actually therapists um, in other states that say the same thing. They need to raise the bar or change the rules for mandated reporting. Hospitals are the, one of the biggest offenders for it. They don't like you. You look at them funny. You tell them you don't want to give them that. You want to give your baby this. They will report on you. Mm -hmm. And you will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're hoping to try and correct and to help families be able to advocate for themselves. And I think, again, you know, one of the big, cons the, one of the big concerns, concerns is that um, a lot of times families are just scared to connect with the, with, with, with CPS. And so what we really want to do is we want to try and help you find those re you know, the, the strategies that can help you do that. And also to work through the things that are making it difficult to, uh, to connect because, or to, to talk with CPS, because a lot of times what happens is when we encounter that, um, what I've seen in clients is that it's bringing up old trauma the way that the CPS worker or the judge or the, you know, the, the, um, uh, prosecuting attorney are speaking is reminding them of things that they've gone through in their childhood. And as a result, they kind of go it back to these sort of like defensive strategies that essentially got them, you know, mm -hmm. that helped them survive in a very toxic situation when they were younger. Um, those defensive strategies aren't working in this particular situation. And so helping you work through that and get to a place where that, you know, you're aware that that energy is coming up, that, but, you know, and that that is not a strategy that's going to work in this situation and helping you find new ones that will get you through that so that you aren't feeling triggered like that when you get into the courtrooms. I, I tell my clients, you know, you have to read these horrible reports and all of this crap that they say about you is not true. It's just noise mm -hmm. and noise can't hurt you. Don't let it mm -hmm. trigger you. Don't let it make you become what they say you are. It's just noise and right. noise can't hurt you. So even though it's painful, I know I read some of that stuff and it ripped my heart out because it's untrue. Mm -hmm. It's just right. noise. Right. And noise can't hurt you. Don't let them make you what they are accused. Don't become what they have accused you of being. And right. we can help you not right. because they're very good at that. Right. Making you look unhinged, making you become unhinged. Right. And so, yeah. So that's about all I think we have to say today. Yes, it is. <laughs> But thank you for tuning in. If there's anything that you need, please feel free to reach out. Um, again, the website is uh, is www.transformationthroughreunification.org. Um, take a look at our website, see what we have to offer. Um, and if you want to make an appointment, just click on the button. You saw the form that we that um, that you can fill out, and that'll give us a chance to uh, connect with you and 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 start to help you work through your case. So. We also have um, our donate button um, and you can donate whatever amount you can and it will go to helping parents get to their drug classes, go to drug testing, to visits, to court. Um, and if you can't do that, you can also advocate with us and, and email us and we can use you and your time to help other parents. So um, we really need to stick together and help other parents that have been through this. And if you have a story you want to tell or, and, and talk to us, let us know. And we are happy to help you. Yes. So my name is Aaron Carranza and thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. All right. Take care.